left, I think. All right. Elimelech, actually. Okay, here we go. Um, so we were talking about the way out of chaos. The way out of chaos. Now, there's a, a tremendous amount to say about this, but I'm going to try and like narrow it down a little bit, at least to um, to start off at least with one verse, and then explain the verse according to the classical commentaries, and then we'll go into it according to what is called midrashic literature, and then we'll look at the Zohar and the Arizal and Hasidic um, uh, explanations of this concept so let me um share screen here one minute if you can't see it so clearly when i share just let me know and i'll see what i can do to enlarge it it should be good but uh let me make sure that i have the chat visible so i can see what's going on is it all visible should be all right <clears throat> okay so i know it's all in hebrew i will translate it um, this is the first, I'm sorry, the second verse in the first chapter of Genesis. First chapter of Genesis of Bereshit, as it's called in Hebrew. And uh, the first the first verse said, stated like this, Bereshit bara lo et et In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, The, actually, interestingly enough, the sages, when they translated the Torah, the sages, uh, 70 sages, were taken by the king of Greece, whose name was Ptolemy, Talma in Hebrew, Talma HaMelech, and he wanted them to translate the Torah into Greek. It's called the Septuagint uh, nowadays. Anyway, he wanted them to translate uh, the Torah into Greek, into Greek, so you could see what the wisdom of Torah was all about. And he took these 70 elders, all of them unbeknownst to the other, he invited them all like individually to his palace. And then he put them in a room, like he basically locked them in a room in different parts of his palace, 70 of them. And he said, okay, uh, you get whatever you need. Here's pen and paper and start translating the Torah into Greek. And all of them, all 70 elders, these were the giants of, uh, of, 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 of study and learning and understanding and so on, the giants of Torah. And all of them made the same, exactly the same changes throughout. Now, what I, when I say changes, what I mean by changes, it's just when they translated into Greek, they didn't want it to be misunderstandings. And um, so one of the things that they did was the first one that they did was actually on that first verse of the Torah, which we don't have over here, where it says, Bereshit barai lokim. In the beginning, God created. So they trans they 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 switch the verse around and they say God created the beginning, because they didn't want Ptolemy to think that there was a God named Bereshit in the beginning or whatever, and that was the beginning of uh, of of um, that was the beginning of creation. It started from an, from another from another source. So they will change it around. But any in any event, that's just a brief historical thing that might be of no interest to anybody, but whatever. Okay, so we now come to the second verse. This is the second verse in the Torah, right? The second verse, and it says as follows. Va'aretz ha'eta, yeah, we're reading over here. Va'aretz, the land. Now, the land doesn't mean land in particular, it just means the earth, right? The earth, the ha'aretz ha'eta tohu va'vohu, it was in a state of tohu and vohu. And um, we explained last week, this means like void and chaos, right? It was in a state of void and a state of chaos. V'choshech apnei tohom, and there was darkness on the face of the deep. And then it goes on to say, V'roch elokim rachefet apnei amayim, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. That is the verse that we're going to be focusing on. And today we're going to focus on essentially these words over here the words to uh, oops the word tohu and vohu and choshek and choshek to home now the sages uh in their wisdom understood that these are actually different terms uh where do i have that here we go 
these are actually different terms. There's a term called tohu, and there's a term called bohu. And I'm going to explain these terms shortly. And then there's choshech, oops. Then there's choshech. And then there's alpnei tohom. These are the ones that we're going to explain. Now, if you, um, oops, if you're playing, if you're paying attention, you'll notice that there are four terminologies here that we're going to talk about, right? Four terminologies: tohu, vohu, choshech, alpnei tohom. In other words, there's four things. There's four aspects of chaos. Four different manifestations of chaos. All of them are chaos. And the chaos is only resolved in the next verse. In the next verse, when it says, he or and God said there shall be light. And there was light. We'll get to that uh, much later. That's already talking about the way out of the void, the way out of chaos. But these are four manifestations of chaos. And that's what we want to focus on and try and understand what these four manifestations of chaos are and how they are relevant to us in our everyday lives. Now, they might, might not all be relevant to all of us all of the time, but all of them are relevant to, uh, to everybody at some time in their lives, all four levels. So let's just uh, discuss them a little bit. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna highlight it so you'll be able to see it more easily. There it is. All right, tohu vavohu v'choshech opnei tohom. Again, that's the word chaos. Uh, let's see if I could maybe um, write it in for you so that you won't be confused. Chaos. All right, that's the first one. Uh, I should do it a bit smaller so that it fits. Let's see, 12 maybe. All right. Um, I'm sorry, that's actually wrong. It's void. Oh no, I went back to Hebrew. Um, that's the void. <laughs> it's not letting me do what I want to do here. All right. I guess I should have done this before. That's the lesson. Okay. That's the void. Tohu, Vohu is chaos. Choshech is darkness. Darkness. Um, and the last one is on the face of the depths. So we'll just call that deeps. Deep. Okay. The deep. All right. We'll leave it like that. So that's uh, now these, these terms over here are not necessarily the English translations, not really good translations. Um, but that's the way they usually translate it void and chaos and darkness and depths the face of the depths okay so let's start to explain there's a classic commentator called rashi rashi is he was actually a french um he was he was a french citizen and um he is the foremost perhaps the foremost commentator who brings out the simple and straightforward meaning of things without bringing any mystical explanation the simple straightforward explanation the way it would be in um, the way you would teach a child, basically. So he explains that the concept of tohu and vohu he explains, first of all, uh, the word tohu, which is an expression of taima vashimamon. Taima means uh, it's like surprise, it's shock, vashimamon, destruction. It's waste, it's void, there's nothing there, right? It's, it's shockingly void, if you want to put it that way. So the first, let's call it the first reaction, the first type of um, response to chaos, i.e. the first explanation, but the first type of response in a person's soul would be shocking emptiness, shocking destruction, shocking um, meaninglessness. Okay. That's how he explains this uh, terminology. There are other commentaries that, um, that go into uh, greater depth, but let's um, leave it for that 
leave it at that for now. And then we're going to explain a little bit further what the concept of tohu and vohu. Now, what is vohu? Vohu is also the idea of chaos. It's chaos that already has a form to it. It's chaos that has a form, right? It's chaos. In other words, it's chaotic, but it's already starting to have some type of what's called in Hebrew a tzura. It has some kind of form to it. Now, we'll find out that the form is inadequate to contain the chaos. And we'll find out about that uh, a little bit later on. But that's the second aspect, the second manifestation of chaos. I'm going to go into this in, in greater depth and, uh, and explain it more. Just, you know, these are the chapter headings, so to speak. Then comes the level which is called the darkness. In other words, where you can't see true darkness, when you can't see, you can't see anything. It's all there, but you can't see it. What's in the darkness, you can't see. And that's part of the danger of the darkness that you have no idea where you're going. You have to just sit where you are. Because otherwise you'll trip over, over all kinds of things. You might get hurt. And finally, we get to the, the final level, which is called the on the face of the depths, in the face of the deep. Now, you notice that this is actually, all of these are single words, but this is actually a whole expression. Alpnate home on the face of the deep. Because there's two aspects to the last one. The first aspect is the alpne, the surface, the face of it. And then there's what's underneath the face, the depth, right? So there's the surface and there's the depth. There's what's on the surface and then there's what's in the depth. And the, and the surface and the depth are not the same thing. In other words, the face that it shows is one thing and the depth that there is behind it, in other words, the depth, as we'll see later on, the depravity, the depth of evil, is something that comes out only later and only with a lot of analysis because you can't see it on the surface. The surface presents a smiley face, so to speak. But underneath is turmoil, right? Absolute rottenness and evil and so on and so forth. That's called the deep, the face on the face of the deep. Okay. So far, we're good. So far, everyone understands. Any questions? Okay. I'm going to skip all of these uh, commentaries. There's actually some very interesting commentaries. Just um, I'll skip the majority of them. I just want to go to, uh, to some of the gematria, some of the um, numerical values, as you probably know by now. Every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has a numerical value. The numerical value of the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet is one. The numerical value of the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet is actually 400, right? 400. So it goes from one to 400. And uh, obviously in between all the other numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and then 20, and then 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, and then 200, and then 400. All right. That's the Hebrew, Hebrew alphabet uh, in general. So each letter has a numerical value and the numerical value of the, of the two first words of that verse are tohu vavohu. The numerical value of them is 430 and 430 equals a number of different um, uh, other words. For example, vahaya kodesh. Now vahaya kodesh means it will be holy. The word haya in Hebrew shows on the past tense, but when it has a vav, the letter vav in front of it, it means vahaya means it will be in the future. Vahaya Kodesh, it will become holy. So just be aware that this is one of the things that is hinted to that whole concept of chaos is that ultimately when we do the right thing and we act in the right way, vahaya Kodesh, it will be holy, right? And not just holy, in, uh, in, in a physical sense, but it'll even be wholly in a spiritual sense because the value, the numerical value of Tohu and Vohu 430, it was also the numerical value of Nefesh, the soul. The lowest level of soul, but nevertheless soul, right? Nefesh, an important concept. So in other words, 
the tohu and vohu that will be, will be holy. In the end, it will be holy. And it will be incorporated into nefesh, into the soul. In other words, into human consciousness. Human consciousness will be able to solve the puzzle of chaos. That's what we're, that's what we're saying. Can you fix past mistakes? Absolutely. Uh, what text are we studying? This is a text from, uh, um, the text that we were studying was from Genesis, Genesis 1, 2. And the text right now is just various gematrias that I found, various numerical um, equivalents that I, that I found. Yeah, so Elisheva asked, can it fix past mistakes? If it doesn't fix past mistakes, then it didn't fix too much. Yes, it can fix from now on as well. And that's a par partial tikkun. But the concept of tikkun, as we will explain in, in at length and in depth, the whole concept of tikkun is to fix the past as well, not just to fix the present. Okay, we'll get there. Um, incidentally, that entire that entire uh, verse that we quoted earlier, that the earth was tohu vavohu vachoshach opanei tohom, it was chaotic, it was void, it was void, it was chaos, there was darkness on the face of the deep, of the depths. Uh, that is the numerical value is 1455. Right, which equals the verse at Kol Tomo'od. Everything that God had made was good. Also, a verse in Genesis later on. Right, it's a verse in Genesis at the end of the six days of creation. Then God looks over the creation. He says, and He sees Vehine Tomo'od. It was very good. Right. So, so in other words, implicit in the creation is that it's very good. We only have to work to bring out the very good aspect of what is a chaotic world okay this is all again only sort of introduction to uh, introductory concepts that we're talking about we'll get more into the uh, the ideas another numerical value of 1455 is the names of the four worlds also equal 1455 atzilut bria yetzira and asiya right all the four worlds the four planes of imminent imminent existence immanent with an a immanent existence are called atzilut which is the world of emanation bria the world of creation yetzira the world of formation asiya the world of action but those four worlds with the four worlds the four planes of con corresponding to four planes of consciousness are the main worlds that are dealt with in kabbalah of course there's anam karmon which includes all of them but uh but the, the manifest worlds are these worlds, Atzilut, Bria, Yetzirah, and Asiya. Anam Kadmon is a, is a non-manifest world. It's a transcendent world. Okay. And there's various other interesting uh, and important gematrias, but we're not going to go with gematrias tonight. Um, that's, not the, that's not the ultimate uh, purpose. What I wanted to get to tonight is the following. This commentary here from Midrash Rabbah. Midrash Rama, again, it's a Midrash. And Midrashic literature uh, has a lot of um, Kabbalah in it, sort of uh, implicitly in it. It's not expressed as Kabbalah, but, it's, but, it, but it contains Kabbalistic ideas, which are um, then picked up and explained in Kabbalistic, Kabbalistic texts to, um, um, to a much greater degree. Uh, until the assembly exists through it all and do the right thing, not responding negatively to the case impact on us, and assess the response from our God that we may not even be able to recognize due to our vows not ready yet. Sorry for the spitballing here. No, it's a good question. Um, do we simply exist through it all? You do your best. Um, we do our best. And even when even when a person has knowledge, um, you know, which which comes with study and so on and so forth. You still only expected to do your best according to the level of knowledge that you have. You're not expected to be able to do, you know, to to um, resolve all the world's problems. There's a teaching from the Baal Shem Tov, which is a very, very, very important teaching, and uh, I've been reading through it um, for the past several days, every day uh, in the morning, trying to um, sort of etch it on my memory. I'll just tell it to you briefly. The Baal Shem Tov is talking about the concept of tikkun, rectification. 
and uh, putting things right. And he says that essentially the two um, areas which need to be rectified. One area is the area where a person has become very, um, let's use the word crass. A person has become crass. The word in Hebrew is magusham. He's become very physicalized, very um, materialistic. But materialistic in a very negative, uh, negative way, like a crass, a coarse, a coarse kind of a way. So that coarseness is um, needs a tikkun. It needs to be elevated to a higher level. Then there is another type of uh, situation that needs tikkun, and that is where a person has done very serious transgressions of the Torah commandments, uh, and his soul needs a rectification because he has a blemish in the soul. The first one that I mentioned where a person is just coarse and crass, that's more of a surface issue. It's more of a... Uh, you know, I, I, I um, can be rectified more or less by changing habits. But when a person has a pagam, he has an actual blemish in the soul, then it's much more difficult to rectify. As far as a person's own coarseness, that he can rectify himself. He doesn't need someone else to help him to do it. He doesn't need a Kabbalist, a tzaddik, to be able to rectify that for him. Or her, obviously. But when a person has a blemish in the soul, for that, a person needs a, uh, a tzaddik, a righteous person, a holy person, to be able to rectify that thing, to help them rectify. Now, when I say help them rectify, it doesn't mean to say that they're aware even that they're being rectified, as we'll soon see. Now, there's two kinds of rectifications. One is the rectification which is done through prayer, and that's... Um, that can be done by um, a person who's not even necessarily a righteous person, in other words, a holy person. Anyone can keep somebody else in their prayers and elevate them that way. In other words, elevate them out of their state of um, out of their state of coarseness, out of their state of living on the surface and not living in a deep way, living in a meaningless way and not a meaningful way but that that can be rectified through a person praying for them keeping them in their prayers but the second type of um, rectification is a re called a rectification through yehudim through yehudim and a tzaddik needs to do this um do i have this published at kabbalah online uh no <laughs> It's all new stuff. Um, if somebody uh, wants to volunteer to transcribe these things, you can, uh, I'll be only too happy for you to do them. Uh, if not, I actually have somebody that might be interested in doing that. I'll try her out. I'll ask her if she's interested in transcribing them. And then we can put it in, um, we can put it online. In any event. Okay. So let's continue, um, and we will explain that the last type of um, the, the person who has a pagam, who has a blemish, uh, the person who has a blemish in his or her soul, um, needs a tzaddik, a righteous, a holy person, to uplift that soul, to, to rectify the blemish. And the way that is done is through yehudim, yehudim meaning most of the time using holy names, um, and the person is not necessarily even aware of it. If the tzaddik just looks at the person, they can rectify the person that way. Actually, someone sent me a video today of um, uh, of one of the great Kabbalists, whose name was the Baba Sali, Rabbi Israel Abu Khatera. I lived in Netivot in Israel. I actually visited him, and I visited him a number of times when I lived in Israel as a student. Um, I lived in Israel as, as, as a married person as well, but I lived there as a student, a single student. And um, I went to his um, son-in-law's, his son-in-law had a synagogue, um, and I went there a number of times as to help, um, just to help with running the show. 
and so on. I don't want to go into all the details, but anyway, we, we used to go there from time to time, fairly regularly. Anyway, I went and I was, I uh, spent some time with the Baba Sali um, and um, on a number of occasions. Uh, let's, let's leave it at that. Um, so there's a story that somebody sent me today to about, um, about a, a person, actually a very famous story. It was a very, very famous story in Israel, story in Israel at the time, the Baba Sali since passed away. But um, the story is that um, this person was in hospital. And why was he in hospital? Because he lost all sensation in his legs and he had some terrible um, disease in his legs that they were going to have, to have to amputate at least one leg. And he was in the hospital and they were basically the next day he checked in and the next day they were going to prep him for, uh, for the amputation. A very, very serious uh, situation. And there was a person who um, would go around visiting hospitals. Um, he would visit sick people in hospitals and sort of try and cheer them up and just spend time with them. That's what he did. A lot of, a lot of, the, a lot of his time was spent just visiting people in, hospital, in, in hospitals. He wasn't paid for it. He wasn't, uh, it wasn't a job of his. It was just something that he felt that was, uh, that was necessary to do just to uplift the spirits of, you know, basically people who were all alone very often or who felt very uh, all alone and just try and lift up their spirits and make them uh, sort of more comfortable and happy and so on and so forth. Anyway, he went, he happened to go to this hospital. First time he met this fellow who had the problem with his legs and he told him, you know, he asked him what's wrong, what's the trouble, why are you in the hospital and so on. And he said to him, the, the man's name was Shlomo. The man's name was Shlomo and he was not a sick person, the person who used to go visit people. His name was Shlomo. So Shlomo asked him, what's, you know, why are you in hospital? And the man replied that he was about to have his leg amputated the next day. And he had to check in because they were going to prep him and so on and so forth. Early in the morning. So why do you have to have your uh, leg amputated? Well, he has an uh, illness and so on and so forth and uh, whatever. So he said, look, he said, look, I, I come from the, I live in the town of Nativort which is where the Baba Sali was. And I know the Baba Sali very well and his secretary. And I want you to come with me to the Baba Sali to get a blessing before the operation. So I said, oh, I'm having the operation tomorrow. What before the operation? There's no time now. I said, I have a car, I'll take you and I'll bring you back. We'll just get permission from the doctors and uh, I'll bring you back. So he took him to, um, uh, eventually he managed to convince him and he took him to, um, he took him to the hospital, to uh, the Baba Sali. Now, this man was not able to walk. He was paralyzed, basically, from the waist uh, down. He wasn't able to walk, but they took him in a wheelchair, whatever. He got him in the car. And then when they came to the Baba Sali, the man said, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want anyone to carry me up to the Baba I'm going to have to get up there on my own steam. And he, like, crawled, basically, on his elbows up the stairs to the Baba Sali's house. And uh, he went in. It was after the time that the Baba Sali generally saw, the, you know, people from the public. But nevertheless, he agreed to see him, and he saw him. And the way the Baba Sali operated was, he um, his voice was very difficult to hear, so he spoke to his secretary, and the secretary passed on the message to the person. So uh, he um, he's, he asked the person, "Why are you here? Why did you come? What's 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 your story?" And he told him the story. And the Baba Sali said to him um, that your situation is um, not as serious as you think it is. And the man like didn't understand really. He didn't understand, didn't understand what was going on. And um, the Baba Sali said to his secretary, tell him to get up and walk. So I said to the man, get up and walk. He said, I can't, I'm paralyzed. I said, uh, the Baba Sali said, you have to get up and walk. So I said, tell Baba Sali I'm paralyzed. I went back to Baba Sali, told him, the man says he's paralyzed, he can't walk. And Baba Sali said again, tell him he has to get up, All right, on his feet, he has to get up on his feet. Now the man hadn't stood for a couple of years already. He hadn't been able to stand. So um, the, um, the man said again, I, I can't stand. And the third time the Baba Sali said, and he raised his voice, tell him he has to stand up. And he gave him a little bit of um, Iraq. Iraq is aniseed alcohol. Um, it's 
I suppose the uh, um, the um, the communities from the east. He was from uh, I think from Morocco originally. So they 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 common drink over there was Iraq, Iraq, like an alcohol, alcoholic drink, a little bit of alcohol, uh, but it's aniseed, it has like a, it tastes like licorice almost, right, aniseed, so I gave him a little bit of Iraq, and he said, drink the Iraq, he drank it, and he said, now get up, all of a sudden, the man started to feel his legs, and he started to feel this tremendous heat in the lower uh, half of his body, and he actually stood up and he was so shocked that he could, like he, could, he didn't know what to do. He just, he just like ran out of the room and he ran down the stairs and he ran to the, to, to the yeshiva, which was nearby. And uh, they saw him like burst into the yeshiva. And I said, what's going on? What's going on? And he just told them what had happened. So they said, go back. The Baba Sali is probably waiting for you. He's going to tell you various things that you have to do, whatever. And anyway, he went back and the Baba Sali gave him a whole uh, bunch of things that he had to do and to tell, to cut a long story short he did not have to have his legs amputated now what actually happened was it the Iraq that he gave him no Baba Sali was doing he was doing Yehudim as we uh, just discussed he was using holy names or whatever it was and he was the kind of tzaddik just by looking at you he could rectify certain things in your soul uh, this person had not been a religious person and he was not Sabbath observant, he wasn't kosher observant, and so on. And from then on, the Baba Sali advised him that it would be a good idea if he started uh, observing some of the Torah laws, um, you know, and adding uh, from time to time. In other words, start with Shabbat and Kashrut, with the Sabbath and eating kosher and so on and so forth. And so it was. And uh, and he survived and he was, uh, he survived. He didn't, he didn't have to have an operation and, uh, and everything was fine. In any event, that is uh, just one story. There's another story, but I don't want to go into too many stories tonight. Uh, that actually happened to a friend of mine. Uh, more or less a similar story, except uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Uh, more or less a similar, a similar story. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, he was uh, a person to uh, hold an extreme honor, that is for sure. No question about it. Uh, Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, we, we can talk about that if, you, if you're interested in getting hold of uh, righteous people. I can tell you, I can point you out to a number of people. Okay, right. So back to our subject. Um, the tikkun we will come to, we'll discuss the tikkunim later on, but just to give you an introduction to the idea that there is a tikkun and we will get to the tikkun. And the tikkun is not necessarily something that you are able to do by yourself. You have to do the maximum you can, but if necessary, a tzaddik, one can invoke the help from a tzaddik and uh, you know, hope that everything will go much more smoothly. Okay. All right. We're now going to do what it says in the Midrash. We're going to do this little piece in the Midrash. And um, this is what I'm going to focus on for the next, um, for the next bit. Rabbi Shimon Lakish Pata Krayab Galuyot. He interpreted this verse of ours, this verse about Tohu and Vohu and and uh, etc. About chaos and the void and the darkness and uh, on the face of the deep. He interpreted, he interpreted it, interpreted it as referring to exile. Now we spoke in the first class about the first class on the subject about the concept of Galut. The concept of the Galut is Galut means exile. The concept of the Galut is that a person first goes into exile internally before the exile externally happens. That's usually the way it works. Sometimes there's an external exile that causes an internal exile, but there's always two exiles. If a person is not exiled internally, he cannot be exiled externally. In other words, if he, if he, if he, he or she completely adheres to their inner redemption, their inner freedom, they will never fully be in exile, even if they're imprisoned and they can't walk outside of their situation. But exile is to a certain extent a mindset. It's not only a situation that one finds oneself in. After all, if you think about it, we're all in exile. We live in a physical body that gets weaker and um, and starts to age, you know, with time. And uh, what you could do as a youth, you can't <clears throat> do as an older person. 
and what one can do. Um, uh, as an older person, you probably can't do when you get even older than that. And so it goes on, you know, there's limitations. The physical body is a limitation as well, right? It is in some sense an imprisonment, but one doesn't have to treat it that way. One doesn't have to treat one's age or one's physical situation, whatever it may happen to be in that particular way. Even if a person is paralyzed, God forbid, from the waist down, I mean, from the, uh, from the neck down, it doesn't necessarily mean that that person is in a state of um, exile, is in a state of imprisonment. One of the sages is in fact imprisoned from the neck down and he was a free soul um, without any, without feeling that he was in any boundaries at all. All right, so the whole concept of Galut, therefore, exile is an internal and an external structure. And the external comes from the internal. The external limitations come from the internal limitations primarily. All right, so he begins to explain the verse that we learned when we started off this class. He starts to explain it in terms of exiles. And he explains it as follows. Now, we're going to explain four exiles. There's four terms. And we're going to explain four exiles. And next time around, I'm going to explain what these exiles are in more detail. And then we will go on to the concept of the redemption from each of these exiles and the path of redemption out of four different types of exile. In other words, four different types of chaos. All right, let's have a look and see what the Midrash says. The Medrash is said to us by someone named Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, Reish Lakish. And I think I explained last week that Reish Lakish was originally started off as a bandit. Maybe I didn't explain it. I explained it in one of my classes. I'm not sure if it was this one. He started off as a bandit. bandit. He was a, highway, a highwayman. And uh, that, was his, <laughs> that was his career. And when he met one of the, one of the great sages, he actually, um, that sage caused him to rethink his position. Uh, he jumped over the river as he was trying to get away. The sage was bathing in the river and he jumped over that river and um, Reish Lakish jumped over that river trying to get away and the sage called out to him and he said, if you have such power in, uh, if you have such power in, um, in, 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 in your, your highwayman career, imagine what power you could bring to your studies, to Torah study, to studying the wisdom of God. And um, the sage who had spoken to him was very beautiful, was very handsome. And Raj Lakish was a bit of a, a bit, you know, arrogant and a bit, uh, uh, how do you say, chutzpah, he was cheeky. Uh, he said to him, and your beauty belongs with women. In other words, you know, uh, you should be a props, prostitute for women. <laughs> Um, so the sage replied to him, my sister is more beautiful than I. And if you join me, I will make sure that she marries you. In those days, marriages were arranged. He obviously saw in this person, he saw in this race, little race like a very lofty soul that was in a complete, <laughs> in a completely uh, negative situation. And they actually brought him out and he became one of the great, great sages of the Talmud. Reish Lakish, one of the great sages of the Talmud. Of the Talmud. Anyway, so Reish Lakish is the person, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, they just call him Reish Lakish for short. Rabbi Shimon Lakish is the one that is explaining this, um, this interpretation. So it says as follows. This, again, the verse we explain in terms of exile, internal and external exiles. So the words, tohu, the word tohu in the verse, tohu, which we described up above, as um, as void or chaos, right? Refers to refers to it's actually the void. Refers to the Babylonian exile. Right? I'll explain all of these later on. Don't worry about it. The Babylonian exile, and then he brings a verse to uh, to prove it. Then the next word vohu. That is the exile of Medea, Medea, Medea. Medea and Persia were sort of uh, twin cities kind of thing, twin kingdoms that, became, that merged into one. 
And that was at the time of the story of Esther and Achashverosh. I'll explain that uh, later on when we get there. All right, so that was Madai. That's the second is the exile in Media, the Median, Median, and Persian exile. Choshech, darkness, is the exile of Greece. Greece, the country Greece. And I'm going to explain all of these uh, soon. And um, the final one, Pnei Atom, the surface of the deep, or the face of the deep, if you want, that is the final exile, which is the, is the Roman exile. The exile, which is called the, the red exile, the, the exile of red, of, of, of Edom. Edom was another name for Esau. Another name for Esau, Jacob's brother. And he eventually, Edom, uh, in, in the form of the Roman Empire, um, caused a tremendous amount of um, anguish to the Jewish people. Anyway, that's called, um, those are the four, those are the four exiles. So again, the first exile was Babylon, the Babylonian exile. The second one was Madai, Medea and Persia. The third one, Greece. And the fourth one, Rome. Now I have them uh, written out over here and I'm going to explain them a little bit more in depth. All right. We, uh, I'm, I'll just read them out for now and I'm going to explain them next week. Babel, that's Babylon is the last for idolatry. Now, what is idolatry? Idolatry is essentially nature without God. In other words, things happen by themselves. There's no divine hand or divine force behind anything. It's all natural causes. And they can't see beyond those natural causes. That was the... the, 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 the um, um, the kingdom of Babylon was a kingdom that was, they were idol worshippers. What's an idol worshipper? Someone who worships a symbol of certain natural powers and they don't get beyond the symbolism or the natural power which that symbol symbolizes. They don't get beyond that to understand that there is a guiding force behind all of creation, behind all of nature, right? The divine force. So there's nature with God out, with God essentially, without God essentially, right? That's nature without God. And that amounts more or less to a lust for control, control of nature, control of things around you, control of your environment, control thinking that you're in control. Thinking that you're in control is the worst form of idolatry. That itself is idolatry. That I can control everything. Does Babylon, Babel correspond to religion? No. Uh, it depends on which religions maybe. Uh, certainly idolatrous religions maybe, yeah. But um, not religion in general. In, uh, yeah, duality without divinity. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, duality without divinity. Or forces of nature without divinity. Right, Medea, Media, which was the exile uh, at the time of Haman and Mordechai, was the exile of what's called in Hebrew pritzut. Pritzut means um, unbounded lust for unbounded sexual appetites. Let's put it that way. Uh, lust for women in particular, and on the other side of the coin, lust for men. Uh, women's lust for men as well. Uh, now, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, with, with uh, intimacy, with family intimacy. In fact, it's one of the mitzvot in the Torah, one of the first mitzvot in the Torah. Be fruitful and multiply. You can't be fruitful and multiply without having uh, sexual relations. Obviously, that's, that is not only permitted, it's in fact a mitzvah. It's, it's a requirement. It's a, it's, a, it's a good deed. It's the right thing to do. But we're talking here about the lust for it. One of the worst forms of um, one of the worst forms of lust is really, and lust is really used in this particular context, is sexual lust. Um, the word lust is used sometimes for other things as well, but it's for sure primarily used for sexual lust, and that's uh, according to um, 
Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, I forget what it's called now, the uh, one that deals with uh, sexual disorders and so on, uh, they say that it is a lot more difficult to overcome than, um, than alcohol, alcohol disorders. And the reason for that is because it's pleasuring oneself. That's what lust is. That's what this idea is all about. It's no, there's no thought of your partner. Essentially in a proper sexual relationship, each partner in the sexual relationship should be, should be thinking about the other one and not about himself or herself. What happens in, uh, in, in, uh, in this lust, this what's called in Hebrew, ta'avat ha'ni'uf, the, the lust for, for sex, is that you think about yourself, not, uh, so in other words, you become the idol in a sense. You become the 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 um, the object of your own worship, so to speak. Okay. The third um, the third exile, the third state of inner exile is called Yavan. That's Greece, and that's knowledge without wisdom. Knowledge without wisdom. There's a lust for knowledge. But a lust for knowledge without wisdom. Now, what's the difference between knowledge, knowledge and wisdom? Knowledge is facts. Well, knowledge is facts that you can derive from. Uh, the Greeks were tremendously um, knowledgeable people. I mean, much of you know Greek philosophy, Greek uh, much of uh, mathematics stems from the Greeks. Um, me uh, mechanical knowledge, um, the sciences. A lot of that comes from the Greeks, but it's knowledge without wisdom. What's wisdom? Wisdom is knowing how to put things in the right context and how to attach them to the source. Where does it all come from and where's it all going to? That's what wisdom is. And that's what they didn't have. They didn't have where it comes from. As far as they were concerned, it was from the human mind, the, the power of the human mind. And uh, where's it all going to? It's all going for to uh, bettering our own situation as human beings. And um, what that all involved, we will talk about uh, at greater length later on. And finally, we get to the fourth type of exile, which is the concept of power, but without humility. Power without humility and compassion. There's a lust for power. That was the Roman um, Last, and that was the Roman downfall to a certain extent, although the Roma, Roman Empire continues till today, even though it's not called the Roman Empire any, anymore, but it's sort of uh, transformed into the Western world. Like largely, that is the, um, the, uh, the how, do call it, how do you call it, the characteristic of the, uh, of parts of the Western world are the, the lust for power, but power without humility power without compassion. And um, a lot of this is explained in the teachings of the Maharal of Prague, the famous Maharal of Prague. He wrote a book called The Mitzvah Candle, where he spoke about the um, the um, the mitzvah, the um, the commandment, the rabbinical commandment of, of, uh, of Hanukkah. You know, when you light the candelabra and the whole, uh, whole nine yards, so he speaks about it there uh, to a certain extent. Um, in any event, next week we will discuss what's the difference between power and control. Yeah, it's a good question and I'm going to get to it. Um, basically, the idea of, I'm just going to tell you basically now, basically the idea of control is um, limiting another person, limiting what another person can do. That's control. Power is overwhelming the other person and completely dismissing them. They just become a chattel. They're not limited, they just become an object, a chattel, a thing uh, of, of no consequence. Uh, that's power. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to stop here, but I'm going to let you ask any questions right now. If there's any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. And then we will continue with this um, theme next week and discuss a little bit more. We'll discuss each four of them, uh, each, uh, each of the four of them, and then we'll discuss the path out of each of the four of them, because there's four, just since there's four different uh, exiles, uh, four different forms of chaos, there's going to be four different paths for getting out of them, obviously. Okay. 
All right. Any questions? Now, obviously, when you, uh, while you're thinking of your questions, obviously, um, you know, if you're thinking about these things, you can start trying to apply them to uh, situations that you've uh, encountered in your own lives. Um, and these are broad categories, so there's many things that fit into these categories that would be definitely part of one or the other of, uh, of the categories. One could say that there are more categories, but really they're uh, perhaps a combination of two of them or even three of them. And um, these are the basic categories which the Torah seems to accept as the four main inner exiles. Again, inner exile is when your inner self is cut off from its source. And um, the question is how to get out of it and how to get back to uh, the path out of chaos, as we said. All right. Folks, any questions? The political stuff, the stuff going on right now really shows lust for power without humility. You know, I, I would have to say that it's on both sides of the political spectrum. Um, on both sides, it's been, I, I know, let's not get into politics here because <laughs> it's a very sensitive subject. But um, yes. Uh, you're welcome, Sasson. Uh, you're very welcome. All right. Um, there are specific rectifications for each of them, yes. We will be discussing them. Four inner exiles, four specific rectifications for each of them, yes. Okay. All right, folks. We will stop here and... Um, I'll put it up on YouTube. As you probably know, the channel is Kabbalah Decoded. If you want to listen to it again or you want to share it with people, it wouldn't be a bad idea to share it with people you think might benefit from it. And um, good. All right. All the best, guys and gals. Uh, Shabbat Shalom to, uh, to all of you. Um, thank you for the, for the good wishes. <laughs> all righty. See you next week. Oh, what am I doing here? I'm supposed to be stopping it. All right, good night.